Good morning. Thank you for bearing with me there for a moment. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not able to speak French with you today. Uh, since the FSF's mission is global, um, we do have most of our materials, many of our materials available in French, uh, including our monthly newsletter. Uh, but I just happen to not be one of those materials, as much as I would like to be. And I want to talk today about uh, FSF's uh, 30th anniversary, um, which just happened this last weekend, uh, and what that means for the future of free software. But first, uh, I actually wanted to start by playing a short video for you. And here we go. And sometimes inside us. Software is all around us, and sometimes inside us. But what happens when the tools we use are obeying someone else? A tool you control serves your interests. But if someone else controls it, they serve their own. When you can examine tools to see how they work, you're able to learn about them, even modify them to work differently or better. When you can share a tool and its changes, you help others, and in turn, they help you. In fact, this is how early computing developed. Everyone could see a program's code, and people shared their work freely to drive its growth. Every user was a potential author. But when companies began to lock source code away, it stopped being possible to participate, or even to know what the code was doing. In response, hackers formed the GNU project to create a computer system designed to respect the autonomy of users. They adopted a copyleft maneuver and built it into the GNU General Public License, a legal structure that preserves user rights. In 10 short years, the free software movement had produced the GNU Linux system, computing that nobody could own, but anyone could use. Like star, right? Today it's keeping planes in the air, stocks trading, and the global internet running. We all encounter free software in invisible ways, but software freedom was designed for people. It's about what shape the technology we inhabit will take, and what kind of society we use our digital powers to build. We've still got work to do. That was a video that uh, at the Free Software Foundation we commissioned with uh, Urchin, a company that makes videos using free software. Um, and I wanted to show that because it was kind of the kickoff for our 30th anniversary, uh, but also because it sets up some of the themes that I want to talk here today about. So, like I said, last uh, Saturday was our 30th anniversary. Uh, we held a party in Boston. Uh, but there were also 22 parties in, uh, sorry, eight, 22 parties in eight different countries all around the world. And that was a really heartwarming thing to see for people to come together and celebrate 30 years of this movement. Um, although honestly, we celebrated one day early. Uh, our actual anniversary is October 4th, but everybody knows it's a lot more fun to have a party on a Saturday night than it is on a Sunday night. Um, and if you see some bags under my eyes, you might understand uh, why I think I'm still recovering from it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but this also isn't the only 30th anniversary that's happening this year. Some of you might be aware that this is also the 30th year of Windows uh, since it was released as 1.0, the same year that the Free Software Foundation was started. <laughs> Coincidence? I'm not sure. So I just am curious, how many people have known uh, who the Free Software Foundation is for 30 years? Got a couple. Yeah. Okay. 
how about 20 years? I think 20 years is about, at least where I come in, at least like recognizing the name and having seen the name, 10 years? Yeah. Uh, how about just this morning? Great. So, you know, it's, it's cool to see those numbers go up, right? Uh, and to see a few hands go up with just this morning, because that means that we're growing. You know, we, uh, we still have people who have been working with us for 30 years, um, but also have uh, people constantly coming in that are new to the whole thing. So this video, uh, first of all, shows a journey. You know, it has a lot of imagery in it about uh, the car driving on the road, and, and that's really kind of the way that it, it feels like when you've been working on something for, for 30 years. Uh, I personally haven't been working on it for 30 years. I've been with the FSF since uh, 2003, so for 12 years. Um, but people like RMS. So it's currently on the front page of FSF.org, and I also wanted it to be the front page of my talk because of the things that it emphasizes. Uh, this journey isn't just a joy ride, right? I mean, RMS and the people that have been doing this for 30 years have a, a destination in mind. They're not just trying to make cool and useful software, although they enjoy doing that too, uh, but they're trying to get to a particular place, and they're trying to do it as fast as they possibly can. And this anniversary has been an, an occasion to consider how close, what that destination is, how close we are to it, um, and what kinds of uh, bad weather we might need to drive through still along the way. And yes, I'm really going to kill this journey metaphor through the whole talk. Uh, and the video also shows some of the dystopian possibilities that can happen if we take a wrong turn, uh, or uh, some of the challenges that we might have to drive through. You know, those kind of sickening images of somebody trapped in a little cell with a lot of cameras pointed at them. I think uh, lots of people around the world have started to feel a lot more like that cartoon character over the last uh, two to three years. Um, second of all, it highlights in its name our emphasis at the Free Software Foundation on uh, user liberation. So even though we're called the Free Software Foundation, uh, we're really about user freedom. We care about whether a program is free or not because that's what determines whether a user is free or not uh, while they're using the program. But we're not in it to save the poor, starving programs. Uh, we're in it for the users, the people who increasingly have all of their personal, uh, political, economic, cultural expression and communication and activities mediated by software. Uh, and third of all, it, it emphasizes the importance of GNU and of copyleft. Uh, what's made the GNU project a, a rare thing over the years is, uh, you know, these days there's so many free software projects out there, but, but GNU was started and continues to be a group whose contributors are motiv by, motivated by a strong commitment to advance the cause of user freedom and the free software movement, um, even while they also pursue technical excellence. And anyone making free software is doing something good, so we should always applaud that, but people do do it for different reasons. And the motivations will show up in different ways. So, for example, many GNU programs will come with uh, very you know, obvious materials, present materials, that introduce users to the ideals of free software. You know, if you're using Emacs, you can uh, make a typo and accidentally bring up a copy of the GPL or uh, of the GNU manifesto. I know that uh, one of our directors, Bradley Kuhn, that's his story. He learned about GNU as he was using Emacs and he hit the wrong key and the GNU manifesto popped up. And I've actually also had that experience. Uh, programs outside GNU do do this as well, um, but it's a bit less common. I was really happy to see WordPress uh, recently, a very popular GPL program, um, add a nice explanation of what free software is for new users to read while they're installing the software. They just added this page uh, in the last major release of WordPress. So it, it does happen in, in other groups as well, and, and it's really important if your goal is to actually uh, advance the free software movement as a set of ideals, um, in addition to making great software. And the copyleft part, I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes talking about uh, after I go through these. But you know, the basic distinction between copyleft software and other free software is that copyleft software must always be distributed and redistributed as free software, the way that it starts. Whereas non-copyleft software uh, allows you to distribute it as free software, but also allows you to distribute it as proprietary software. And we're going to go into the significance of that more in, in a minute here. And then the, the last thing that, was, that strikes me about this video is that it's, it's made with all free software, which is pretty cool because you know, we have lots of people telling us that you can't make uh, good videos or good art using free software. And I think this is a great demonstration that that's not true. Um, 
and this is another way in which the commitment to uh, ideals as a motivation shows up. So when the Free Software Foundation makes advocacy and educational materials about free software, we use free software to make them. When we talk about, uh, communicate about free software development with each other, um, we use free software to do that. You know, if it's voice, we use things like WebRTC or Akigo or SFL phone or, or Ring, you know, coming up, uh, not Skype. You know, people might call this dog fooding. I think that came from Microsoft. Uh, that always sounded a little bit gross to me. Uh, prefer to think of it just as walking in the walk. Right? And when you're motivated by ethical principles, you feel a lot more pressure to actually walk the walk and use the same kind of software that you're encouraging other people to use. And plus, you know, walking the walk, that journey metaphor uh, that I'm still hanging on to. So the other night, uh, during his address at the anniversary, RMS said this, and it stood out for me. He said, if you want to finish something taking decades, nothing's more important than remembering where you're trying to get to. And I'm sure he said this many times before as well, but it was a highlight of his speech on Saturday. So I want to flesh out this description of, the, of that destination where we're trying to get to a little bit more. I think people have some misconceptions, those who are familiar with the Free Software Foundation, about what our goal actually is. So we really want all computer users to be able to do everything that they need to do on any computer using only free software. And by computers here, we mean phones, tablets, televisions, refrigerators, computers with four wheels, uh, everything that has a general purpose processor on it, everything that has software which can be replaced by somebody and upgraded or changed. So this means that in our utopia, in our destination, uh, there is no proprietary software. You know, obviously we live in a world right now, in a context right now, where we have free software mixed with proprietary software. A lot of companies do both. Uh, most people use both. You know, the, with Android being in everybody's pockets, most people are using a combination of proprietary and free software every day. Um, but for us, that's a transition. Um, obviously, it's, going, it's hard in some cases to make the leap fully, but keeping in mind that where we want to get to is for everything to be free, really influences a lot of the choices that we make. And as long as we stay focused on that, it makes uh, a lot of them clear. So RMS uh, drew us a, a detailed map of the destination, you know, if, uh, expanding this a bit more, and that's the free software definition, which I'm sure lots of you have read. Um, I just want to go through it to make sure that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about when we say free software. So it's characterized by four freedoms. The first, freedom zero, is the freedom to run the program for any purpose. So your word processor can't tell you that you're not allowed to write documents uh, criticizing the government in it. You have to be able to write what you want, use it how you want. The freedom to study how the program works and change it so that it works how you want it to work. You get to see the source code. Uh, source code is a precondition for being able to exercise this freedom. If it's in binary form, you can't really study how the program works and you can't uh, reasonably change it to do your computing how you want. So this is the freedom that makes uh, free software a good check on like back doors, because if somebody puts one in there, then lots of people can see it, and uh, hopefully somebody will be able to remove it. And then freedom two, the freedom to redistribute copies. Um, the easy one for uh, people to identify with, if you have a program that you like, you would like to be able to share a copy of it with somebody else without being called a criminal. And then the freedom to distribute copies of your modifications. So if you fix a back door or somebody fixes a back door, the ability to share that fixed version. Uh, you know, the, these ones give the whole community a chance to benefit from your changes. If, if it's my code, I would, that's a very loose definition of the word benefit. Uh, but anyway, we should have the freedom um, to do that. So you might have also heard these things called open source. Uh, we say free software at the Free Software Foundation, uh, not just because it's our name and we're stuck with it, um, but because we want to be able to talk about free as in freedom. We want to be able to draw parallels between free software and free speech, free software and freedom of the press. And even though this is, you know, whether you call it open source or free software, it's a new thing for a lot of people. You know, it's, it's going to be hard to explain no matter what it is. And yes, saying free software might confuse people sometimes about price. But I think if you ask people about open source, you'll find that actually a lot of people who aren't that familiar with it think that you also can't sell open source software. They also think that open source software always costs zero dollars. So the labels aren't the cause of the challenges. Um, the main purpose of the label is to give us a tool to address the challenges. And free software for us is the best one um, because it is very easy to make the jump from free software to other ideals that people are familiar with, like free speech. 
So I encourage you to, to talk about it in those terms as well. So there's different kinds of free software, and, and all free software is good. Uh, but unless it's copyleft, uh, the rug can be pulled out from under us, so to speak. So like I said at the beginning, um, software that uh, is under a non-copyleft license can actually be taken and put into a proprietary product. So Apple's OS X has a lot of uh, software in it, which started out as free software. Under a non-copyleft license, Apple was able to take that software and ship it in proprietary form um, to users and build their operating system around that. Now imagine if, uh, if Linux or GCC um, had been distributed that way in the beginning. You know, where would we be today, right? Probably some, somebody would have picked up uh, the kernel Linux and turned it into a proprietary product. Probably somebody would have taken GCC and built proprietary compiler extensions on top of it, or maybe even released a modified version uh, with a lot of funding behind it as a proprietary product. That really would have pulled the rug out from under um, decades of free software development. And it's, this is a hard lesson for us to remember sometimes because we're in a, a world now where we have lots of free software available to us. So it doesn't seem like that big of a deal um, whether it is licensed under copyleft terms or not. We have so much of it, uh, we can forget sometimes how that came to be. But uh, we are entering a phase now where I think we're in a, a nearly equivalent danger to that thought experiment of what if Linux or GCC had been released under a different license. Uh, and we have had some recent lessons about this. For example, in 2011, um, Google announced that it would not be publishing the source code for Android 3.0, uh, other than the parts of Android which it was legally required to, like the kernel Linux, because that was under the GPL. But the rest of the Android stack, Google just decided not to release. They just made an announcement that said, we're going to uh, ship it to the vendors who have a license agreement with us so that they can put it on their products, but we are not going to release the source code to the general public. They had the ability to do that because the Android stack is under uh, primarily the Apache license, which is a non-copyleft license. So it's great when it's free software. Um, and you know, we at the FSF, we sponsor a version of Android called Replicant, um, which takes Android and removes all of the non-free pieces that are on a typical Android device. So we're able to do that because Android is distributed by Google as free software until it's not. So later on, Google did go back and, and put the source code for those versions up. And since then, they haven't done this. But it's a scary moment, and it's something that we need to remember can happen at any time. And when something is as significant as the Android platform uh, for modern computing, that's especially scary. So as individual users, it's, it's scary for our freedom. Uh, but also, as businesses, um, it means we don't have a solid foundation to build on. You know, Products we depend on, like Android, can suddenly decide to be proprietary going forward. They can suddenly start uh, charging licensing fees for the freedoms that previously you were able to exercise uh, on your own and you've built your business model around. Uh, and the only recourse in those cases is to go back to the last version that was distributed as free software and fork it um, and try to maintain it yourself. You know, and that's, that's a very burdensome thing to do. And in addition to providing a strong foundation, um, Copyleft is important for business in providing a level playing field so that uh, you get to benefit from changes that other people make um, as to the software that you're working on. If you, as opposed to non-copyleft software, where you put your code out there under a free software, uh, in free software terms, and somebody else can just take it and roll it into their proprietary product and never share any of their work back with you. So it helps you know, raise the field and keep it level. And yes, it's, it's more complicated to ship proprietary software when it's near GPL software, and that's why a lot of businesses tend to uh, knee-jerk towards non-copyleft licenses, but it's really not that complicated. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, myths out there about it, and one of the services that we provide at the Free Software Foundation is a consultation service for companies that are making, want to make sure that they're, doing, that they're distributing GPL software in the right way. So if you have any doubts about that, you can always um, contact us. But also, keep your eye on the long term. Uh, no matter how complicated distributing a GPL program uh, in the same product as a proprietary program might seem, it's almost always less complicated than navigating the thicket of proprietary license terms that you have to deal with when you uh, buy different pieces from uh, other suppliers. Right? I mean, the GPL is one license. You just need to learn about it. Like, that's the only one you need to learn about uh, if that's what you are releasing your software under. If you're going to 
uh, be involved in proprietary software, you have to master many different individual agreements with many different suppliers, and they're rarely exactly the same. So in the long term, uh, focusing your business on GPL software is the key to getting to a simpler future for you and, and getting away from those complications. I know there's some doubts. Uh, people raise concerns that the GPL is restrictive uh, because it has requirements, like it must always be distributed as free software. Well, every license uh, almost has requirements. At the very least, they have requirements to preserve things like attribution and copyright notices. So the question isn't whether a license has a requirement at all. The question is, uh, what purpose do the requirements serve? So I don't like to call the GPL's requirements restrictions because their only purpose is to prevent people from restricting you. Uh, that doesn't really make sense to call that a restriction. Even if you do, um, there's something really wrong with, I think, I've never understood saying that the restrictions in the GPL are bad because they prevent somebody else from restricting you. Right? If restrictions are bad, then why don't we have a protection that says that other people won't be able to impose restrictions on the software? So I think that once you think of it that way, that every rule in the GPL is designed to make sure um, to address specific ways in which people sometimes try to make free software proprietary and make sure that that never happens, those things stop feeling like restrictions or requirements. Start, stop feeling like restrictions and start feeling more like protections. But even copyleft software under the GPL has been restricted in different ways. Um, the license uh, GPL v2 for example, um, GPL v2 covered software was taken by various companies and put into hardware that would then reject any modified version from actually running. You know, it would do like a cryptographic signature check. So yes, you had the legal right to modify the software under the GPL, but if you tried to actually put that software on your TiVo, for example, uh, it would not boot. So that's an example of having the freedoms on paper, but not actually being able, being able to exercise them. Um, and again, imagine what the world would be like if back when Linus Torvalds was working on uh, Linux for the first time, uh, manufacturers started locking down uh, PCs, right? Like he would not have been able to install a different operating system kernel or test it on a device if the device was set to only run uh, authorized kernels by the manufacturer. Uh, we also see this a lot um, in the App Store. So... And this confuses people sometimes, I think. We have some programs that are so well known that if you see the binary in the App Store, you think of it as free software because it's distributed in source form from some other place. Um, but that doesn't mean when you get it from the App Store, you are getting a free program. The application is actually modified by Apple to encrypt it and make it work with the iPhone's DRM system, which means that the user can never actually get the complete corresponding source code for that program which means that the user doesn't know what else might have been put into that program or what it's actually doing. So in order for software to be free, it's not just that some source code has to be available somewhere. Uh, for a similar version, the actual source code for this program, the identical version to the binary, needs to be available. And we really want users to be able to install modified versions not just on paper, but in reality. Because if you can only see the code and not change it, then you're still at the mercy of the manufacturer uh, to install any fixes. You, know, you might be able to identify a problem and report it, but then what? You, know, you can't do anything about it yourself, and you certainly can't uh, share any fix with anybody else. So this was a major reason why GPLv3 uh, was released. Because GPLv3 uh, makes it so that you cannot have such restrictions imposed on the free software. If there is a signature check on the hardware, which is allowed, uh, the user has to be able to, for example, in install their own approved key so the user can make the decision that, oh, I like this uh, security aspect that the, my hardware won't run uh, unauthorized modified versions, but I'm the one that's in control of it, not Apple, right? Uh, and we got a good lesson about this recently with Volkswagen. So Volkswagen was caught uh, cheating on emissions test by using proprietary software, which behaved differently uh, when it was being tested than when it was on the road. So there's been a lot of talk uh, in our communities about whether free software can fix that problem or not. And I think it's a big part of the answer. Um, but 
you know, if someone had been able to see the source code, source code from Volkswagen, they could have identified the problem sooner. Uh, but that's not the only thing that needs to happen. Let's say they identify the problem, they also need the ability to install a fix for it. Uh, other third parties, don't just think about individual car owners, but also you know, a repair shop, a mechanic, other people who should be able to fix cars. So as we go towards the future with our computerized cars, we need to keep in mind that it's not enough to have the code distributed under a free license. We also need to be able to install modified versions. We see a disturbing trend um, toward locking down the bootloaders on tablets and other ARM devices. Uh, and this is a good reason to use GPLv3 for your software because it's a shield against that kind of behavior. If you are writing code because you want other users to be free, then make sure that you close some of these back doors. That security concept, which is usually the justification for locking a device down, is, is really a tricky one. Uh, Apple likes to say that part of the reason for locking, only allowing authorized applications to be distributed through the App Store is to defend users' security. But whose security does it really serve, right? So it doesn't allow you to install programs to protect you from Apple, right? It only allows you to install programs that Apple thinks are secure for their interests. Same thing with the uh, Microsoft Surface tablets, which are locked down so that malware can't be installed at the bootloader level. Um, but oh, it just so happens that also means you can't install Android or GNU Linux on that tablet because they're rejected as unapproved operating systems. So those aren't security. Uh, Android may, in fact, be more secure than at different times than the Microsoft operating system. The user should be able to make that decision themselves. And you can have the best of both worlds. All that's required is that a user with physical access to a computer be given a way to modify the signing keys and be able to sign, uh, add a key from someone else they trust or their own key. And then that will enable them to install a platform that they actually trust for their interests. And anything locked down becomes a platform for abuses. Once a manufacturer has a way to lock a, ma a machine down, they won't just use it for security historically. Uh, they use it for all sorts of other purposes. So. Car companies are claiming that the entertainment system in the car needs to be locked down uh, in order for, to protect safety on the road. Well, it's not going to be long before you see them selling ex exclusive rights to companies like Yelp to install applications on the entertainment platform in the car and not allow users to install their own applications. That doesn't really have anything to do with security, but once there's a lockdown environment, manufacturers start selling exceptions to, that, to their partners to allow other people to uh, put their programs on. So it's not really just about security in the end. I want to talk a, a little bit more about people using copyleft and some trends, uh, but I'm just going to go briefly through this. There's some been a lot of discussion about whether copyleft is increasing or decreasing relative to non-copyleft licenses. And just a few things to keep in mind if you read any articles about that. Was the methodology for that study published? Uh, was the source code available for the tool that was used to count licenses? And does it really cover the whole picture? When you make a, a software license choice, you're not just choosing copyleft versus non-copyleft, you're choosing proprietary copyleft or non-copyleft. And I suspect that a lot of the growth in the non-copyleft area is from people who are actually choosing that instead of a full proprietary license. So it's not really right to say that you know, the GPL and, and non-copyleft licenses trade off one for one like that. So, in order for copyleft to be effective at protecting our freedoms, it does need to be occasionally enforced. Uh, people who um, try to make GPL software proprietary are committing copyleft infringement, which is legally the same as copyright infringement. So how do we deal with that? Well, I have RMS and a sword. Uh, this is a M with a katana that someone sent to the office, inspired by an XKCD uh, cartoon. It's pretty funny. He actually refused to pose with it in any kind of like actually aggressive uh, manner, though. Now, that's not really how we do it. Uh, when I was going through our archives this summer, I found this letter from 1989 addressed to RMS, uh, thanking him for taking the time this morning and helping a company understand the Gadoo Emacs license, which was the predecessor to the GPL, uh, and talks about the same problems we talk about today, mere aggregation versus derivative works, and these concepts that those of you working in free software licensing are familiar with. Uh, and it concludes with uh, the company agrees to change and distribute it properly, and, and thanks RMS for his time uh, in explaining the issues to them. So that's a lot more closely, that's a lot, lot closer to how we do GPL enforcement even today. Last week we published a document called the Principles of Community-Oriented GPL Enforcement. 
Um, and this is Joshua Gay, our licensing and compliance manager, explaining that GPL enforcement is mostly an educational process where we work with a company uh, who has generally made honest mistakes, and we help them use the license in the proper way so they're able to continue distributing GPL software uh, and not have to go to court or anything like that. Or, so these principles are designed to make companies feel a little bit at ease about some of the FUD that's been going on about GPL enforcement, and also to just formalize how we've been doing things since 2001, to make it clear that the goal in our enforcement work is to expand the free software community, enable businesses to participate along with individuals and other kinds of organizations. So uh, this is on our site and the news items from last week, but the ones I want to highlight here are that we consider legal action a last resort, uh, and we value confidentiality, even though in the free software movement, we are very uh, hesitant to have any kind of confidentiality restrictions. The whole movement is based on sharing information. Uh, we recognize that when it comes to talking to a company who is messed up when distributing GPL software, uh, it's better to start a private conversation with them first rather than just you know, uh, post a bunch of uh, public accusations. Find out what their side of the story is, see if we can help them fix it. And then we go through it very carefully with them, make sure that we've found all the possible violations and help them fix it, and they're able to continue distributing the GPL software at the conclusion. So we really need copyleft. Um, if free software's major long-term impact is enabling people to more efficiently make products that restrict us, like cars and tablets that won't let you change the operating system, then we've achieved nothing for the real value of computer user freedom. So I encourage you all to use the GPL for your software and keep that end goal in mind. Uh, if you are interested in, in reading more about these ideas, we just published the new edition of Free Software, Free Society by Richard Stallman with a foreword by Jacob Applebaum. It's the third edition. Uh, includes a lot of new essays, revisions of old essays. It's a great textbook, basically, to start from uh, in reading about these issues in the philosophy. And if you want to help tackle these problems, uh, we're looking for a deputy director <laughs> to work with me uh, in order to help guide the FSF's approach, strategy, and, and manage our staff. We are funded about 80% by individuals, which is extremely rare for a nonprofit, but is awesome. It means that we're actually accountable to the individual users we're trying to protect. I encourage you to please support us. Join as a member if you can. Have your employer also contribute. We have a lot of great companies that support us as well. If you are a speaker about free software, please submit a session for our Libra Planet conference. The call just went up. The conference is in March in April, or sorry, in March in Boston. Uh, we do have people that come uh, from Europe and all around the world to attend and speak. So I encourage you to do that. Thank you very much.